But when you're making eight dollars an hour in a, in a climate like this, you know, yeah. that's not going to be enough. So have I, it made me when I saw this question, I said, what it made me think about. Have you noticed in the? Do you look at the online browser that we get? And have you noticed the comment that they're highlighted in yellow when the Lord puts someone on your mm -hmm. heart and mind? Mm -hmm. Act on it. Act on it. <laughs> so, and I'm thinking that you know sometimes it's just who knows what it is that somehow somebody you think of somebody and and there's something that again you're seeing something you're hearing something you're feeling something but if you have a connection to it you know if that connection to somebody um, we need to act. And, and it sometimes changes, you know, in your case, you know, that's, it was part of, I don't want to say your job, but it was your job, you know, to... My commission, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But all of us have that, you know, all of us have opportunities where all of us have a chance to do something for somebody else, you know, and, and it's because of something that we've seen or heard that motivates us to do that. So anyway, the next section of the starting in chapter or in verse 11, Moses has grown up. At this point, he's actually about 40 years old. And I, my Hebrew, according to my commentary, the Hebrew word translated as had grown up literally refers to the age when one is able to marry, to choose one's way in life, and to take part in the family business, among other things. It's actually not clear how Moses became aware of his Hebrew roots. I don't know if he looked you know, significantly different, or, uh, but it is clear that he identified with the Hebrews. He knew that he was a Hebrew, um, and he saw them as his own people. Thus, when he saw their difficulties, he felt the injustice on a very human level. Specifically, Moses saw that uh, a Hebrew slave being beaten, and he killed the oppressive taskmaster and hid the body in the sand. The next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. So in verse 14, what happened when Moses tried to intervene? What was the response he got from these Hebrews? They're going to kill me too? Like did yeah. To the Egyptians? yeah, so it's like they, they didn't say, oh, gee, thanks for making us aware. It was like, oh, you know, who are you to unplug us? You know, why are you getting involved? Yeah. My feeling on that is that one guy, the guy who was saved, shared the story, and the rumor mill is what caused the damage. So somebody heard it, somebody heard it, somebody heard. Right. And that's how it got to that point. Right. And, and uh, obviously Pharaoh eventually heard about it. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to kill Moses. And so Moses obviously fled. Um, but thinking about when Moses' involvement first with the, the Egyptian and then with the Hebrews, why do you think he acted that way? What, why do you think he got involved. DNA is horrible. <laughs> well, they probably seen the oppression that the, that the Hebrew was getting from the Egyptian. Right. And it made him, you know, respond in that way. Right. Because he thought he would be justified by doing it. Right. And he thought he was being, and when he, go ahead. I was just going to tell you that um, I got this from Robert, that when you're adopted, and he knew mm -hmm. he was adopted, you're always rooting for the underdog mm -hmm. because you feel like an underdog. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, thank you. That's a good observation. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So he wanted to, but and then when he gets involved with the two Hebrews, he thought he was going to be helpful and try to say, you know, hey, you guys need to be united. It's bad enough that you got the Egyptians, you know, but why are you fighting each other? So. Um, what are your thoughts about his response to, first of all, with the Egyptian? I mean... Well, I think he thought he was justified by doing it right. because of the oppression. Right. But he, obviously, a lot of Egyptians were causing a lot of oppression to a lot of people, and they couldn't go around killing everybody. You know, it was, um, so anyway, he was very impulsive. He, he, did, he did something very impulsively, um, and he was considered a criminal by, under Egyptian law. So, um, kind of unfortunate. So Pharaoh heard about Moses' reaction, and his life then was turned upside down by that one impulsive act. Hmm. He found that he had to flee. So 
So um, he went to Midian for safety. Um, the Midianites were descendants from Abraham, so they were vaguely related to them. The, the country was somewhat south and east of the Dead Sea, which is now part of the area of Arabia. So he went through the Sinai Desert or wherever and got over to that to Midian. And it says there is where Moses met the seven daughters of Ruel, um, who was a priest of Midian. Um, just so you know, when we get, you're going to study chapter three next week, and Ruel also was known as Jethro. Mm -hmm. so, two <coughs> so they invited uh, him to the the daughters of. They, they don't get into a whole lot of detail about this because we skip some verses in the reading, but. Um, Ruel, you know, says to, you know, he has them bring her home. Well, I'm sorry, let me back up. What happened in the, in the section that we read today? What, how did he get involved with the daughters of? The shepherds <coughs> chased them away from water and the flocks, and he stepped in. Right. And helped them. Right. So, in that verse 17 is where that happened, and it says, what character trait then do we see emerging and re-emerging in Moses? Same thing. Yeah. 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 So it's always help, help the underdog, if you would say. Right. Had a lot of sympathy and empathy mm -hmm. right. for what was going on around about him. Right. And it's interesting, you know, that that happened, because he, here he was, you know, a, a, a Hebrew that grew up in a privileged situation. He'd probably been raised with have been, being, have a, even himself having authority being raised as he was. Right. Right. So well, he said he was known as Pharaoh's daughter, so that should have gave him so, some rank to right. be known as, right. as Pharaoh's daughter. Right. Well, there's there's some indication. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure which Pharaoh this was or what you know, what his family situation was, but there was, my, one of my commentaries suggested that it was possible that he was being groomed to become a pharaoh himself someday. Mm -hmm. That went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and it doesn't talk about how pharaoh felt about his daughter suddenly having a son. Yeah, Although, yeah. Yeah, I because mean, she didn't get him until he was a little bit older, but that, you know, Right. At that point, all of a sudden she says, "Hey, Dad, you know, look what I've got." <laughs> you know, it's, and he would not have questioned the parentage or anything. Right. So, so Moses flees to Midian. He helps the the daughters. They go home. They tell their dad what happened. You know how they were able to get you know their flax watered with the help of Moses. And and he says, "Well, where is he?" You know. And so they go back and get him and bring him home, they call him an Egyptian. Um, he was raised an Egyptian, but he was aware that he was Hebrew. The family invited him to stay, and he eventually married one of the daughters. Um, the complex nature of his identity is revealed in the naming of his first son, Gershom, which means, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. So Moses became a shepherd tending his father-in-law's flocks for about 40 years before the next part begins in chapter 3, which we'll study next week. Um, in verse 23, where uh, in, it was in our reading, what does that tell us uh, about what was happening with the Israelites back in Egypt during all this time? They were groaning in their slavery and cried out. Okay, so it wasn't getting any better, right? And, and they were growing in numbers. Growing in numbers. And what, had, what also had happened in the meantime? <coughs> oh, yeah. Oh, the, yeah, the king, the yeah, first so, king died. Yeah, yeah, so that pharaoh is, would have been his adoptive father, grand, grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. So it had not changed for the better. Um, slavery and oppression had been such that they groaned and cried out for help. And then in verses 24 and 25, I, I accidentally, I, Addington pointed out that I gave you the answer to this. What four action verbs <laughs> describe God's response in this passage? Comfort. Comfort. 
God heard, God remembered, God looked, and God was concerned. Thank you for the answer. Yes. <laughs> I wished all my tests had been that way. Amen. I told, he, he said to me, he emailed me and said, are you sure you wanted the answer? I said, well, no, I didn't intend to, but I already had these printed. Yeah. Well, we only got so much time to that. Kind of and it saves me writing all those things. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Uh, okay. So God, God was very involved. He was actively involved. The fact that he heard and he remembered them. He wasn't forgetting. But what was he what was he in the process of doing all this time? Working his plan. He was working his plan, which it involved this is the part always ama um, amazed me that God could for forget. And as I grew older and did more Bible study, I am, began to understand that God would delay something. Not because he wanted to delay it, but because he wanted the people to understand what was going on and to appreciate what they got. Okay. Yeah. Yes, no, and wait, right? It's a long wait, though, 400 years of wait. I love those good espionage movies where people know things at a certain level, you know, and they react because of this. And then there's another guy who sees all this playing out, and he's, he's got his plan, and he needs to have all those pieces going. And then, <laughs> and then there's another level. But, you, you know, it's just like um, as we grant God the, um, the, the uh, omniscience, you know, the all-knowing the all factor, there are so many fractions underneath. <laughs> there are so many fractions underneath that expand, you know, with their little objectives, you know. But somehow they all report to the larger. Well, that's the thing, is that I personally do not understand to what extent God directly involves himself. I mean, you know, you're you're in the process. You as an individual are making a choice. Do I go this way? Do I go that yeah. way? And to what extent does God, you know, kind of... <laughs> Push nudge you along to make you know a certain choice because eventually everything is working towards. I, I rode with Darlene Overstake one time to pick up some cupcakes for an event or something like that, and, and she's pulling. Okay, God, you know I need a mark parking space now. Come on, <laughs> and it's like this guy pulls out and she pulls right in. Thank you, God. You know, and I go in and get the cupcake. And she, I mean, like in her mind, it was every every step, every breath, every step. You know, the whole thing. Well, doesn't God stay with us every minute? Mm -hmm. Well, again, we, we I don't stay with him every right. minute, but he's, he's with us every minute. Mm -hmm. I think Mary Lou's question, though, it, it, you know, I mean, a lot of our kids are, are, are granting God a systemic type governance, but very doubtful that he's in on every parking space mm -hmm. that you're going to find. So, I mean, Mary Lou's question is, you know, the spectrum between every move and, you, you know, here I give you this gift, work it out, and give it back to me. Sorry, Ellen. <laughs> Did you get it again? Yeah. Put your, put your yeah. basket here. First, I think it will serve if you give it over <laughs> Yeah, this way it will go over me. <laughs> so, from what, what we gather what here, we what do we learn about God? Oh, Say what we know is that God will always be God, mm -hmm. which means He will always be doing, for lack of for sort of a profane word, He will always be doing godly things because He will always be God. He will always be doing stuff, but to what extent do we tap into His power to do things? You know, or, or there it is. When we let him. Isn't it human nature to want to do things on our own? Oh, sure. Are we? And then we, you know, step us back a step and realize, wait a minute, we're not doing God's will, we're doing our will. Mm -hmm. Sounds like teenagers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and I, again, you know, like you were saying, I do that sometimes, you know, where I, I have minute little things, you know, okay, I need help with this, that, you know, and then God might answer that right away or whatever. But there's a lot of times that I make decisions or I, I make plans to do things and I think in retrospect, hey, I didn't really involve God in this decision, you know, so I, you know, I go back, you know, and kind of ask God to bless my decision, you know. Forgive me. <laughs> yeah. So... So from, from this discussion, what do we learn about God's timeline? It 
it's his timeline. Yeah. Yeah, it's not ours. Yeah, it's his timeline. Well, look at how we long some of the things in the Bible say that it started something you know, like 40 years in the desert. You know, that's kind of a, in, in a way, when you think it, that's a harsh punishment for not doing, you know what I mean? Well, he, you know, Abraham should have looked at that rock a little bit. Well, and, and yet all the decisions and all the choices that led Moses to be there in the hmm. first place, God probably would not have called him out of Pharaoh's palace, you know, to lead his people away. You know, it made it easier for him to, you know, more closely identify. And to, and, and actually, you know, the it's not that he suffered being a shepherd, but he had a little bit better of a taste. He was being groomed. There were things that, from his early childhood, he had a good, ed probably had a good education. You know, he was raised in leadership capacity, you know, things because of his standing in Pharaoh's household. But then he got the taste of what it is like to be, you know, the common person, you know, and to relate with people. So God was grooming him that whole time in order to, and he was waiting for the right moment. Um, and then sometimes God puts stepping stones in mm -hmm. our way to so lead you to another path to get his will. Even though, well, I want to go this way. Well, there's a wall there. You can't go that way. Right. And that's in a sense a good thing because it many times leads you to right. the correct that kind of go and that kind of goes back to the question you know that I asked in four about how how often have you found yourself drawn in a situation that would normally be off your radar if you haven't seen or heard or felt something it's because somehow something has happened you know in your life you know you make plans to do certain things and then something all of a sudden something happens that you see, hear, feel something, or, you know, and in some cases it could be a stepping stone of some sort that, that and forces the you to go into a different... And the general told us we were going to Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it had to be God's will. You figure if he was raised as an Egyptian, which their attitude towards the Jews were, to all of a sudden be sympathetic to the Jews being yeah. raised, that he shouldn't be that way. Right. So you know that had to be not his will, it had to be God's will working in him to give him that attitude to save the Jews. Do we know if he had any relationship with his biological family? Well, the only reason, that, and I was just thinking of that, because that's why I said, you know, we don't we don't really know how he knew he, he his heritage. And yet, somehow he reconnected with Aaron and Miriam. So, wasn't he Maybe wrapped they, in a... In a uh, Towel or, or a Hebrew towel. A Hebrew yeah. towel. But his mother was his nurse for years. Right, right. right. Really so maybe there was a, a connection all the way along in his life, even mm -hmm. though nobody else knew about it, but right. he did. And if she nursed him, there was a bond. Yeah. yeah. Singing songs. Mm -hmm. There you go. And so the songs tradition. stick. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but they were Hebrew songs. Right. Or mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. So during all that time, God had not forgotten his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, and all of Moses' experience uh, through his life as a member of Pharaoh's household, his time as a refugee and shepherd, provide the framework for, for all that is to come. God's plan for divine redemption will involve the most unlikely people to accomplish the impossible. So, I mean, we know Moses' story because obviously Moses wrote it, you know, and we, we have it embodied in the Bible. I'm sure there were other people, you know, that did things along the way that we just never heard about, you know, but nothing quite as significant as what Moses was about to do. You know, Moses was, uh... so anyway, It's, it's um, easy for us to look back and say how everything fell into place. It was so neatly constructed. You know, whoever wrote the story was a good story, right? Mm -hmm. And it's easy to look back now and see all these things that happened without realizing that at the time they were happening, I mean, they were just happening then, and you know, Moses wasn't writing the story, and 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 Mir well, not Miriam yet, but uh, Pharaoh wasn't writing the story. They were all actors; they all had parts to play, but they were just living out their lives and doing what would come naturally, whatever a Pharaoh does naturally. I don't know. And uh, the women down at the water who were found the baby in the basket, and uh, they were they were playing out their parts. They were telling, they were living the story as it was being told. Right. And our, is, doesn't that happen to all of us? You know, we're all living 
our story. Right. We don't always we don't always write our story. Sometimes we just happen to be there at the right time <coughs> when things happen. Or the wrong time. Or the wrong time. <laughs> Somebody's time. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, actually we're at the end of our time, and just you might want to look at the questions eleven and twelve. Mm -hmm. You know, just asking if you've ever felt far away from God and what you learned from that experience. Um, our inclination when we don't feel God's presence close to us, sometimes we think God's abandoned us, but we know intellectually that's not true. And ask the question, what criteria do we use to determine if God is close to us and helping us? And I would think that the criteria would be right. his word, his word, his word. Look. Anyway, that's our lesson for today. So well, it was a, a familiar story, but there was something in it, I think, for sure. So, yeah. it reminds us that he's with us. Yeah. yeah. And that even when we don't feel what's happening, and that he doesn't forget us, and that there's always things going on in the background that we don't always necessarily know what's happening. Anyway, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you because you are close to us, because you love us, and you care for us, and that. You are concerned about um, how our lives, um, are, the outcome of our lives, and we just ask that you would help us to, to do our part to uh, be faithful to you and to do, to seek your will and to do what it is that you would have us do, and each of us with our own story, each of us with our own tasks to do, and that your kingdom may be enlarged and that, you're, uh, that we in turn will be blessed and that we can bless your name. It's in Jesus' name. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.